The next 60 minutes will be about serverless data processing. Just to give you a, a little bit of an overview of uh, what we will be reviewing today or looking at today, um, we'll quickly um, go over some of the technical benefits of Cloud Dataflow. This is a level 300 sessions, uh, session, so we'll skip most of the uh, basic stuff and just uh, uh, we'll provide some of you, but dive deep into the technical benefits um, pretty quickly. Uh, we'll do a demo of uh, a new feature that we, uh, that we launched just last month, uh, Dataflow templates. It will show you how easy it is to do data processing without operating any servers uh, and launching pipelines without any servers. Uh, I'll then uh, deep dive into uh, two particular benefits of cloud data flow, uh, specifically dynamic load balancing and auto-scaling. I'll do a demo of auto-scaling and show you um, the history of auto-scaling for a particular pipeline that I will launch. I'll call uh, Ankar to stage, and he, he's going to talk about uh, how Brightcoff is using uh, cloud data flow and, uh, and several other GCP products to, uh, to provide video analytics to their customers. Uh, we'll have a recap and we'll also do a Q&A. Uh, if you would like to ask questions, we have two microphones in the aisles. Um, so at the Q&A session, just come up and feel free to ask. So um, m most of the customers, before they start using Cloud Dataflow, they use something that is called a Lambda architecture, uh, a collection of tools, Hadoop, Spark, Kafka, uh, which is optimized to, uh, for specific uh, flows of data, for batch processing and for streaming processing. Once, once our customers are switching to data flow, uh, they take advantage of uh, a unified model. This is one of the major reasons why customers are migrating to cloud data flow. Uh, it offers a unified way of doing batch and streaming, and you can use it in conjunction with other GCP system products such as PubSub and BigQuery to build your data processing pipelines. If you're a fan of uh, open source computing, and who isn't, uh, you can also use Cloud Dataflow uh, with, uh, with another stack of uh, data processing applications. Uh, we have open sourced our SDK and it became Apache Beam, uh, which just recently became a top level Apache project. Uh, and you can use Beam runners on a variety of, in, in a variety of environments, including Spark, uh, Flink, and some others. To summarize uh, why customers are using Cloud Dataflow, by the way, uh, just by, uh, by the show of hands, who has already uh, been able to run a few Dataflow pipelines? Okay, a good, a good maybe a third, a quarter of the audience. Um, so Cloud Dataflow offers you a unified way of doing batch and streaming. Uh, you get access to a fully managed environment so you can spend your time on optimizing uh, your pipeline code instead of uh, running and managing server infrastructure. Uh, we offer you a open source programming model so you are not locked in to just one vendor. Uh, you can run Beam uh, pipelines in Cloud Dataflow or you can run, in, uh, run it in on-premises or other cloud providers with other runners such as Spark and Flink. And we're also able to, uh, to scale from maybe a 10 records per second incoming data stream to millions of uh, records per second. Architecturally, uh, here's a architectural overview of Cloud Dataflow. Um, we are a black box that connects uh, sources and sinks uh, we support streaming and batch sources. We call them bounded, unbounded sources. And we, we write into a variety of sinks. So we all offer connectors for sources and sinks. And then we also offer a bunch of benefits uh, under the hood, uh, including we create the worker VMs for you, which actually execute and run your code. Uh, we optimize uh, the pipelines that you submit to us. You, uh, you can keep kind of thinking uh, at, the, at the more abstract level um, you know, if, I, if you are a SQL programmer, think about kind of writing a SQL query and then submitting it to a database and we do the optimizations for you. Uh, we scale resources for you up and down, uh, depending on the workload. And we do a redistribution of work between workers when particular workers become hot. I'm going to talk about two specific benefits later in my presentation. Uh, but that was kind of an overview of uh, all the benefits that Dataflow provides. Uh, if you are a developer, 
Then from a developer's point of view, uh, you write pipeline code. We support multiple uh, languages, Java and uh, Python. Uh, this code has uh, access to uh, a wide variety of data transformation uh, functions uh, in our SDKs. Uh, the SDKs are language independent, so they offer the same functionality in both Java and Python. Uh, we call it the Beam model. Uh, Beam provides abstractions. For example, if you want to uh, to parallel uh, uh, to, to process data elements in parallel, uh, you can use uh, a transform called Pardo. We call Pardo is the our transform for parallel processing. Uh, if you want to group things by key in any language, Java or Python, you use a group by key transform. And as I already mentioned, um, once you wrote your pipeline and kind of chose your uh, your language, your SDK, uh, you can run it in uh, a variety of runners. You can run it in Cloud Dataflow, uh, you can run it in Spark, and you can run it in Flink. Um, so I wanted to highlight four specific technical benefits of Cloud Dataflow before I do my first demo. Uh, I already mentioned the, the full management aspect, aspect of Cloud Dataflow. We create workers for you, we allocate we, we split your data inputs into smaller shards and allocate them to workers. Um, we also do optimizations of your execution code. For example, you might start with a pipeline. And pipelines can be thought of activity diagrams where you have bubbles of uh, transformations and data uh, flowing from one transformation bubble to the next transformation bubble. Uh, so you think in terms of these activity diagrams and what you want to do with data. You define your transforms and you connect them. Uh, you submit your pipeline graphs to us and we optimize the execution. Sometimes we will merge steps together if we think that it will be more efficient to, uh, to do tr both transformations together. Sometimes we split them up uh, to achieve a higher level of uh, parallelism. Yet another benefit of Cloud Dataflow is auto-scaling. Uh, so think about a workload which maybe starts with um, just 800 records per second incoming data stream. It's the beginning of the day, your users are not doing much, so just generating about 8,000 um, records per second. Uh, we'll allocate just the sufficient number of uh, workers which, uh, which are required to process this incoming uh, work stream. Now, during the day, uh, your users will begin submitting more events. Uh, it might reach several thousand, 5,000 in this example. Uh, through auto-scaling, Cloud Dataflow is able to sense the increase in CPU utilization, the increase in incoming data rates, and increase the number of workers automatically to a much higher number. Not only do we increase the number of workers, we also decrease them when the workload is um, when your incoming data stream is declining. And lastly, the, the last feature I wanted to highlight, and uh, these are the two features, auto-scaling dynamic load rebalancing, which I wanted to kind of deep dive a little bit later. It's important uh, that I cover them on a higher level first, uh, is dynamic work rebalancing. Um, I already mentioned that when you kind of tell us your data inputs and let us allocate the, the workers to, to process these data inputs, uh, some of the data shards which we create, data shards of your input data, uh, might, might contain data which takes longer to process than all the other shards. Uh, we call such shards stragglers. Um, and sometimes, um, well, actually quite often, uh, because of the existence of stragglers, your entire data pipeline will take longer to execute because we are waiting for the completion of the, of the straggler. Uh, with this feature that we have, dynamic work rebalancing, we're actually able to steal, take away work from the worker which is struggling and reallocate it to other workers. And I'll show it in a demo, uh, which I want to do just now. Can we switch to the demo machine, please? First in the demo, I'm going to start with uh, showing you how easy it is to, uh, to start a Dataflow pipeline. Uh, we have recently launched a feature called Dataflow Templates. Templates allow you to write your pipeline, deposit it into a GCS bucket, and then call on this code 
whenever you would like and wherever you would like. You can initiate this template uh, from the console. You can initiate this template into a data flow job uh, from uh, G Cloud or through the API. Uh, in my demo, I'm going to use a export of a publicly available data set of Hacker News. Those of you who know me uh, know that I, uh, I'm very excited about text analytics. I love uh, natural language processing. I write algorithms for uh, crunching through, uh, through, uh, through news articles, trying to extract opinions from text. Um, so uh, I, took the, uh, I took one of the public data sets that we have, uh, uh, Hacker News uh, news posts, and dumped them into a bunch of uh, CSV files for this demo. As you can see in this GCS bucket where I dumped my uh, Hacker News data set, I have about 30, 40 CS CSV files of uh, a size of about 125 megabytes. But one particular file is extra long, and you'll see why it's important. Uh, this file, a very large file, CSV, is 5.5 uh, gigabytes long. And those are the strugglers I'm talking about. Sometimes your data is just larger, your data shards are larger than other data shards. So let me start my data flow pipeline. I'm going to go to the data flow console and click on run job. In this new UI, uh, you're able to choose which template you would like to instantiate. Uh, some of the options are I can do a custom template. Custom templates is the code that you write and uh, place in GCS, and you can then share it with others, instantiate it into data flow jobs, etc. Uh, I will actually use a, uh, a simple algorithm that we typically do for, uh, typically kind of share with customers uh, when they start learning about data flow. It's the word count algorithm. Uh, um, it, it's quite simple. It reads from text files, counts the number of words, and then does statistics on, on, these, on these words. I'll give the job a name, demo job 01, and specify my input GCS bucket. I'll use a pattern uh, to catch all the CSV files in this bucket. And lastly, I will also specify my output bucket where the text statistics should uh, eventually end up. That's all I needed to do to, to launch a data processing pipeline. Uh, I didn't have to install any IDEs. I didn't have to launch any DMs, um, I can basically launch now uh, pipelines through the console using the templating mechanism. And within seconds, uh, Dataflow will start showing you the execution steps of this pipeline. As I mentioned before, it's uh, relatively simple. It reads lines from my input files. It runs the text calculation algorithms. Uh, it does some mapping uh, work and then it writes into GCS files. I will come back to this pipeline uh, in about 10 minutes and uh, to show you a couple of other things that I will continue talking about uh, during my presentation. Uh, slides, please. So this is the code of the pipeline, reading from files, applying a uh, data transform to calculate statistics on text, uh, in parallel format the outputs and writing back into files. Because Cloud Dataflow is a parallel data processing uh, service, uh, we offer you as a user the ability to run your transformations, data transformations in parallel. And we, we call these uh, capabilities paradus. So basically you define a transform function uh, we call them do functions, do funds. And then uh, you tell the, the part do transform to go and execute your do function. A do function takes data in a certain shape. In this diagram, it's represented by yellow, uh, yellow bricks or yellow uh, squares. 
and it reshapes them into data elements of a different shape. Maybe adds additional fields, removes them, aggregates them. Uh, again, in the diagram represented as uh, green uh, stars. Since Cloud Dataflow is a parallel data processing service, uh, we run many, many workers that do, that execute your transforms. Uh, and the best way of visualizing uh, what your uh, workers are doing, your worker virtual machines are doing, is to display a Gantt chart. Uh, in my diagram here, I have eight workers working on data shards. Data shards are my, is my input data set that I subdivided into smaller chunks. So these eight workers take a data shard, they work on it, they complete it, and they start working on the next data shard. Here's a uh, real life Gantt chart of a uh, data flow pipeline of uh, 400 workers uh, running for about 20 minutes doing three things. It reads files, it then does a group by key operation, and this is why you see this very clean separation between stages. First needs to read the files. Once it has the entire data set, uh, it begins uh, grouping uh, data by, by keys, and it also writes into files. With uh, parallel data processing, one of the big problems that I mentioned before is uh, the, the presence of stragglers. And stragglers are really uh, your data shards which take longer to execute than the average execution time for all the other data shards of your data set. In this diagram here, stragglers would be uh, the, uh, the bar in red, and uh, the yellow one is kind of approaching the, uh, the cutoff. Where do stragglers come from? And this is important because if we want to provide you a service which does uh, minimizes the resources that we, that we utilize, that ex improves the execution performance of your data pipelines. We need to be able to detect stragglers, and we need to be able to deal with them. So the first step here is to understand where they could come from. They could be coming from, from an uh, uneven distribution of your input data. For example, if, uh, if, your, if your input data sets are uh, textual files, perhaps pick your favorite language, let's say English. Um, English has a natural sc uh, uh, skewed data distribution to, uh, to the frequency of uh, words starting with a particular letter. Um, so all the, all the uh, data shards which contain words starting with a T, for example, will be longer than your other data shards. Where else do data shards, uh, uh, strugglers come from? Uh, well, um, for example, if you do a join operation and you have, to, um, you have two input data sets and you're trying to join each key on the left-hand side which, with the corresponding keys on the right-hand side, for some of the keys on the left, I'm using the left-right terminology in joins, for some of the keys on the left, you will have many more records on the right. And this is, again, another reason where you could have stragglers. Not only does the data or uh, your data could, could kind of lead to stragglers, you can sometimes also have uh, issues with the infrastructure. And you can have issues with networking or perhaps a slow disk, something, uh, something is going on with the OS or the VM. Uh, resor there are not enough resources on a particular virtual machine that runs your code to, to process data quickly. It's yet another reason for data stragglers. What could you do to address, the, uh, address this issue? Well, you could start splitting your input data into yet a uh, high number of uh, shards. That, that might help um, in some cases. You can try to let your users, you being the, the vendor of a uh, data processing service, you could let your users uh, define business rules and try to kind of fine tune how many workers are allocated to which shards, uh, which of the workers are being allocated to the shards, and so on. You know, it's a little bit complex, but can be done. Uh, you could collect statistics on data uh, before the execution of the pipeline and, and create and start 
you, your stragglers first, for example, uh, so that they can complete uh, faster. On the hardware side or the infrastructure side, this is especially something that uh, folks in the Hadoop world do. Uh, you could do backups and, re and restarts, uh, which help with, uh, with this problem. Well, at Cloud Data Flow, we spend a lot of time thinking about these problems, and uh, we deal with them by uh, first detecting strugglers and fighting, uh, fighting meaning uh, 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 dealing with, with, uh, with this problem. So the first step is to identify strugglers. So what do we do? We, for each of the shards and each of the workers which process these shards, we always track the estimated completion time. We always estimate how long it will take to finish the processing of an active shard. And when we, when, when we see that the expected completion time exceeds the, uh, uh, the average completion time for all the other shards, we raise a, uh, a flag. This is an indicator for us this shard will become a struggler and will slow down the pipeline. So what do we do? We split them up. Splitting up means we ask the worker, which is responsible for processing these strugglers, to, to give back some of the work that they're responsible for. The giving back could consist from, you know, give me a, a range of uh, line items in your input data set. Uh, give me as particular IDs in your input data set that you are unable to process quickly so that I can reallocate it to other workers. So we continuously do that, and in my diagram here, the green bars represent work that is already completed. I have eight workers. They've already done um, nine shards. Uh, the fourth worker did already two. Uh, the yellow bars represent the shards they are currently actively working on, and the, uh, the beige uh, bars represent the estimated completion time. And for each of these shards, we've calculated the estimated completion time, and we detected for two of them that they will be late, and so we will try to allocate the work, we'll not try, we'll reallocate the work, we'll take away work from these shards, and reassign it to other workers. Not only do, it, do we do it once during the execution of the pipeline, we do this repeatedly. And here's what it, uh, it actually leads to. Uh, going back to my uh, example of uh, a real-life pipeline, it's actually an example I haven't shown yet. Um, the pipeline uh, is a relatively simple transformation. It does only one type of transformation on your data, and it runs on 24 workers. I'm talking about the diagram in the upper left uh, quadrant here. So 24 workers trying to do a very simple transformation, very simple pardo, uh, but there's a skewed data distribution, and uh, two of these uh, shards will take much longer than the rest. Without load rebalancing, the execution of this pipeline will take nine minutes. But look what load rebalancing did to, to this pipeline. It reduced the execution time almost 50% to about four, four minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, and look how, how much more utilized your workers are now. Uh, they complete in approximately the same time. Here's another example of a pipeline that I've uh, mentioned previously. Um, 400 workers doing somewhat more um, involved transformations, uh, a uh, read par do, so reading from files, doing a group by key, writing to files. Uh, the data is not a problem. Data is uniformly distributed, but uh, there's still a little bit of uh, uh, a lag between some of the workers in the reading part and some of the um, uh, variation in the workers in the writing part. With, uh, without load rebalancing, the pipeline takes 20 minutes. With load rebalancing, um, the savings are not huge, but they are nice 25%. Uh, utilization is significantly higher, and we've reduced all the slack, all the white space between the workers. Dynamic load rebalancing is great in isolation, but it especially is useful when you start thinking about adjusting your workload 
to the variations in the incoming uh, uh, data stream, what we call auto scale. Think about a case where you, you, know, you start with three workers. Uh, that's my diagram up uh, in the first row here. So three, three workers working on uh, several data shards. And for the first couple of minutes, uh, since we're doing uh, re-estimation of the completion time, every, everything looks fine. It looks like we can process the data within 10 minutes. Uh, not a big deal. But as time progresses and as data flow is consistently and continuously re-estimating the completion time, we learn more about the input data sets. We begin sensing that the actual completion will be much longer. Uh, the first couple of records in our data shards, we are atypical, and the average record in our data shard will cause the pipeline to take three days. Great. So we realize we could definitely use some, some additional help. Why don't we start 100 new workers and crunch through the data just by throwing more CPU on it? Well, we could, but if you don't have the ability to divide the work, of a live running pipeline, your additional workers will be idle. There will be nothing for them to do. So without this ability to dynamically reassign work and rebalance work, uh, auto-scaling just doesn't work. And here's a diagram, here's a, here's a screenshot of uh, another real life pipeline, uh, which starts with um, three workers and kind of keeps learning about um, the properties of your in, uh, input data and realizes, yes, we can, process, uh, we can process the pipeline faster if we added more workers. And it's great that we have the ability to, to divide the work. So we launch new workers, we allocate work to them. Every worker is working hard. There's no white space. They're fully utilized. Um, eventually, a pipeline reaches thousands of workers it crunches through the data and completes, and then scales down, shuts down. Let me show you uh, how exactly uh, auto-scaling is benefiting you uh, on the example of my pipeline that I just recently launched, uh, demo machine rules. Awesome, all right. So here's my pipeline, back to my pipeline. It completed within, um, within about eight minutes. Uh, the reason why I know it's completed is are the green check boxes in each of the transformation steps. For those of you who haven't seen the data flow console before. And one interesting feature that we have in the Google Console, uh, Google Dataflow Console, uh, is the history of auto-scaling decisions. So check it out when you go back if you haven't seen it yet. Here's the full history of uh, what went on in your pipeline. Uh, read, it, read from the bottom, read from the bottom of this um, uh, screen. We started with a pool of a single worker. And remember, I had about 40 files in my input data set of approximately the same size with only exception of one file which was 50 times longer, 50 times larger than all the other files. So we, uh, Dataflow kept re-estimating and reallocating workers. We increased the number of workers to two, then eight to 15, and 15 seemed to be the kind of a, a good balance of uh, number of workers and available data inputs. So we kept working at that level until we processed all the records and then shut down. Hopefully this, this was a uh, uh, useful demonstration of the capabilities of dynamic load rebalancing and auto-scaling. And with this, I would like to invite Ankar Shohan from Brightcov to talk about how, how Brightcov is using uh, data flow uh, at Brightcov. Can we go back to the slides, please? Thanks, Sergey. Hello, everyone. I am. There we go. Hello, everyone. I am Ankur Chauhan from Brightcove. I am a software engineer with the video analytics team. 
Uh, Brightcove is an online video platform which uh, provides video end-to-end so -end video services to uh, companies, large and small. Uh, there's supposed to be Snapchat over there, but kept on disappearing after 10 seconds. <laughs> so we provide video analytics to companies, big and small, uh, which means that we handle lots of data. We deliver about 8,500 years of uh, video every month, which generates about 7 billion events a day, which generates a lot of time series, but because we believe that raw data just crunched up together and summed up is not useful, we aggregate it down to about 80 million unique time series. And uh, this, all this is maintained by a pretty small team of engineers, about five or six of us. Uh, so basically half of the team is here. So as Sergey pointed out, we followed a pretty traditional approach. We went with a Lambda model. So as you can see, the top part is optimized for streaming calculation, whereas the lower part is more of a batch system. Events come in through the top from our web players and Roku devices and Android devices and iPhones. And they come to our uh, beacon over HTTP, get aggregated in real time and stored away into uh, the real time database. Uh, at the same time, we write all of this down into logs and store, and store it to S3 so that we can aggregate it every few hours because one of the deal which you make with the Lambda model is that the streaming system is really optimized for, well, being real time. That means that it is lossy. Uh, so to take care of that, we have a reconciled database which goes in every few hours and happily churns through all the logs and uh, gives it to a reconciled database. And the API comes along for every uh, API request and says, Hey, give me the data for this, uh, this request that the user is trying to make, merges the two data sets, and gives it to the user. On the side, we have a um, Redshift database, and over that, we have uh, some BI tools written. So if anyone uh, knows the work that goes into managing a Lambda model system and everything, they would know that it's a little latent. Uh, Hadoop takes a lot of time to churn through data. You don't absolutely get all your results immediately. Plus, there are more or less two code bases here. So you know, every so often, we would get a support ticket which says, hey, my result from yesterday doesn't match the result from today, or why is this ever so slightly dif different? So there was always pain for that. So all. All this is working fine, and for many years it did. And then, you know, uh, things happen. You know, most important one is Brightcove is a growing company, and more people come online and they watch more video, which means that we have more scale, and we're adding more disks, we are adding more compute nodes to our Hadoop cluster, which is now bursting at its seams. So. We are spending more and more time uh, just keeping the lights on, essentially, uh, which means that lesser and lesser features get delivered. So we had to do something about that. But even more important is that there were some new features in line, uh, specifically session collation, which we thought was really important. Um, session collation basically means that we had to look at a viewing session in its entirety. It's a much more resource-intensive thing to do, and the Hadoop and the homegrown streaming system was just not cutting it. It was a lot of work, and we wanted to get something better. At the same time, we wanted to use a more performant execution engine, which could support all this and the future things that we want to do, as well as a more uh, robust and uh, performant database layer which could take care of all this. So we went, you know, we did, did our research, and we found that everyone seemed to recommend these slew of 
um, technologies. They're pretty amazing technologies. They're open source, so you can actually see the source of the product, and you can figure out whether they actually wrote the tests that they did. Um, the, they are performant. They have big communities behind them, so you know that you know if you get stuck, you'll have someone to turn to, and hopefully they will be able to answer your questions. Uh, so Kafka, Spark, Cassandra, Hadoop, Mesos, all good. And we were like, yay, let's do this, sit down. So we started planning, and within the first 15 minutes of planning, you know, beep, beep, beep. Pages going off in our heads. This is a lot of systems to manage. And with five people, we would essentially be just managing these systems. And we had to, first of all, become experts at these systems to run them, establish them, build monitoring resources for them, so dashboards and alerts. And then each of these systems have like, I don't know, 500 wearables to tune just right to get them working in the right way we want them. So it's not easy. So we were like, OK, we need to step back, look at this again. So the basic theory in this architecture is very sound. You have a simple thing that you are trying to do. Event collector goes to a message queue, which goes to some computation thing and gets written to a database and we want to write it to a warehouse and finally serve it out. But each of these components are very heavy, so we wanted to sort of make them lighter. And what we wanted to do was look for some managed solutions for this, for each part of the system, so that with the five-person team, we actually manage less and do more. So, looked around and lots of claims, lots of marketing material, but if you're an engineer, you're taught one thing for sure, trust but verify. Never trust a marketing material or a blog post just because it says 100% managed and performant. So we went out, we wrote uh, lots of performance tests. We did our due diligence in making sure that we could swap every component individually without sort of getting locked into the wrong thing. And we went step by step to make sure that we got it right. So easy, pass, easy parts first. We saw Google, and we saw Google Container Engine. Best way to deploy an uh, application. So we went with it. We deployed our microservices for the API on top of GKE. Straightforward, we knew how to do it, run some, uh, there are lots of resources to help us out, and it's Kubernetes, so even more community. So that, that was perfect. Next, we went with how to deal with Kafka. Kafka has this magical dependency called Zookeeper, which, if you have managed it, it's, it's just completely magical in terms of just going down for no apparent reason. So we didn't want to deal with it. Um, and what we found that PubSub was a very good replacement for it. It is a globally available and durable message queue, which means that all the work that we would have to do in terms of keeping replicas alive and making sure the Kafka is properly provisioned for our scale and is all good, we don't have to do. So three months saved. Uh, message deduplication by ID. So you can, with, the, with, the, uh, with PubSub and Dataflow working together, you can actually deliver messages again and again and assign them a unique ID, and Dataflow will make sure that it processes that message just once. So exactly once. <laughs> and finally, uh, it's because it's globally available, very little chance that you get disconnected from every single region of Google everywhere in the world, so pretty much not going to happen. So, great. Next thing that we looked at was our database. It's the single most pain point operational burden of 
uh, of our team. Like we have spent weeks sometimes just bringing the system up. So we wanted to find a solution to it. Our data set is time series based. So big table, um, Cassandra was our first choice. And then we looked around and we saw big table was there. And if you read the Cassandra docs, one of the inspiration for Cassandra is the big table paper. So you're like, OK, Google knows what it's doing. It's a pretty well-respected paper. So let's check it out. We wrote our performance tests, and it just blew past everything that we thought. In addition to that, it's one button scale up and down. So you go into the console, you set the number of nodes to 30 and save, and it's done. And it provides an interface using the good old HBase API. So there's lots of tooling for it, and it works very well, very reliable and performant. So database, another win. It's the easy button. And finally, ad hoc analysis and doing BI kind of things. Uh, at our scale, we get terabytes of data every day. So sooner or later, a support call will come in which says, hey, can you find this absurd thing from your data set? And we wanted to answer that question. Uh, and in the past, whenever we had to do that, it was a couple of days of going to S3 and downloading a whole bunch of logs running it through grep or some other tool that we wrote and giving the answer. In, if you have used big queries, you'll know how easy it is to actually run queries in it. It's a console, you write the SQL query, and it's done. It's almost as cheap as just storing files in S3. And it's completely managed, and it churns through terabytes in seconds. So uh, immediate win for us. Things that used to take days for us to debug and diagnose took maybe five minutes at best. OK, elephant in the room, Spark and Hadoop. Uh, it's, it's a monster system because it's trying to solve a monster problem. But it's something that we wanted to tackle. So we again looked around. And just at this time, Google Dataflow had come out of beta. So sorry, come into beta. So we looked at it. We read the paper uh, that was published. We read some blog posts. And we read some docs. And we liked every single thing. It was right there. And we trusted none of it. Uh, followed by we went in, and we you know, wrote a proof of concept over a, over a hackathon. And two days later, we were like 50% of our feature set was implemented in it, which was great. So, so we s sort of sat down and looked at it even more. It, for the first time, I think it provides a unified batch and streaming uh, model. The B model is very powerful. So you don't have to maintain two ident almost identical data, uh, code bases just to do the same thing, which is a big win. Um, Streaming reconciliation, which means that whenever, pub, whenever a message gets picked up of PubSub, you know that it's going to get written, it's guaranteed to get done, and you don't have to do anything of, of the sort of retries and all, all those things. And finally, it's batteries included. What I mean by that is it comes with a slew of inputs and outputs, sources and sinks, so you don't have to implement them. There's like text input, which Sergey used. There's PubSub, and on the output side, we use Bigtable, but there's BigQuery, text output, many others, and lots of windowing operators. So we want to do session collation. Uh, we have to essentially say window by session and done. So immediate win for us, and we were already one year ahead in our, uh, in our game of implementing all this stuff, which is great. So putting it back into our original architecture diagram, everything inside the dotted box over there is a managed service. 
what that means is that we would never get a page for those services, which also means that someone in Google who is very well uh, trained for that job knows how to diagnose, debug, and fix those services when they do go wrong. And it's a much linear system, which means that when things are not working or when we want to develop something, we know exactly where to point at, we know what to tweak, we know how to reason about it, which makes everyone's life easier. So what, what did this give us? Lesser pain, more features, faster, and if you look on the side, we now have another uh, box, which is BI tools and ad hoc analysis. So we got more stuff done because we were able to get access to tools which had much lower marginal cost. There's, there's no thinking around, this query is going to take eight days to run, so let me not do it. You just go in, run the big query query, get your answer, get on with life. All of this took about six months to sort of perfect and get it right. Uh, there were lots of lessons learned. And if, if some of you have managed Hadoop, a lot of that knowledge transfers over. Specifically, if you want to speed up your data flow or your processing, the best way to do is process less data, reduce your I.O., use a better disk, namely a SSD disk. They're much faster. You'll get a performance boost like without doing anything. Secondly is use a schema, schema data interchange format. Protobuf is a great one. We started with JSON. JSON is great when you're just starting out. It lets you tweak and twiddle with stuff, but it's not optimized for machines. That means a lot of your computer is just spent serializing, deserializing. And in addition to that, you would spend a lot of time just cleaning up the data. So you'll write tons of code just to make sure that the right fields are present, the right format is there, or something other, other in the same thing. So we use Protobuf, and we like it, and it provides many, many features, some of them being it's efficient and backwards compatibility. Finally, being from an analytics background, I, can, I cannot stress this enough. Monitor everything. What makes sense for our workload, CPU and PubSub backlog, may not make sense for yours. You might have a completely different set of metrics which makes sense to you. So monitor them. We make lots of dashboards so that we have visibility into everything. And that's worked out very well for us. And finally, when all fails, you get stuck. There's a data flow team which was very eager to help us out in, in, at, on every turn. So we really like the team. And then before I go into a short little demo, uh, this is a future roadmap which I would not be showing over here at all had we been implementing all this stuff uh, using Spark and Hadoop. Adaptive aggregate, so we analyze our customers' request volume and their request patterns and automatically adjust how we aggregate our data so that their queries magically become faster. A Lot more BI tools. Uh, we have started to build a lot more BI tools on top of BigQuery, which give us uh, which give our internal customers much more visibility into data, which just wasn't there. And finally, and it's a big one, that we are able to unify our analytics and billing pipelines. Because there is a hard guarantee that your data, once it's acknowledged, actually gets saved to our database, we can be sure that it's good enough, good enough that that data exists. So the billing system can trust this data. Analytics system always, you, our previous analytics system always had this thing that the billing data was ever so slightly dif different, so we would trust the billing and there would be questions about it, like why is it slightly different? And we would have to explain, no longer. So that's great. <laughs> Everyone's happy, everyone is joyous, 
So with that, I'll show you what our pipeline actually looks like. This is, OK, I'm going to cheat a little bit because demo gods are never great during demos. So this is a video of the same Google uh, Cloud Console of our production pipeline. Um, as you can see, we are reading from two PubSub topics at the top, performing a bunch of computations on them, and churning through data constantly, and then finally writing it back uh, to, uh, to Bigtable. The amazing thing here for me is that it's a very simple representation of a complex piece of software. Each box directly lines up with a piece of code that we have written. So even though Dataflow underneath the covers is performing all these um, optimizations of you know, all different sorts of optimizations, we don't have to do those. And that's amazing. And we can just concentrate on how things look like. So that was how our pipeline looks like. And next we have maybe. Uh, next we have the monitoring dashboard. So a main intuition behind making this dashboard is keeping it simple so that when you wake up at 3 AM because of a page, First of all, the black color does not hurt your eyes. The second part is that everything is, is exactly what you, uh, what you need. And so the first row is PubSub metrics. For us, PubSub backlog is a good indicator of how we are doing. So when uh, you know, there's a sudden increase in message, messages published to us, and data flow starts falling behind, and it doesn't keep up for some threshold, so let's say three hours, we get an alert saying that, hey, go look at PubSub, or go look at the data flow. It's not keeping up. We come here, and we see that, OK, uh, message volume increased. PubSub is backed up because data flow is churning through it. It'll be good. Just leave it. If it's, uh, it's auto-scaled, It'll scale up, process everything, scale down, everyone's fine. The CPU utilization, uh, we monitor that just to make sure that we know that we are spending the exact right amount of money. Um, we want to keep these machines as utilized as possible, but not so much that they are over, overwhelmed. And low CPU is generally a good indicator that you know, the pipeline just seized up for some reason need some more work. So to the point monit monitoring that helps you go back to sleep. <clears throat> and with that, uh, I will hand the mic back to Sergey. Thanks, Ankar. So let's recap. We, we took a look at how easy it is to launch Dataflow pipelines using Dataflow templates. Uh, we deep dive into two specific technical benefits of uh, cloud Dataflow, dynamic load rebalancing and auto-scaling. And we also heard from uh, Brightkov uh, how easy it was to build a video analytics solution uh, using Dataflow.